Good morning. This is Louise Hay. Let's begin the day together. If it is possible for you to listen to this before you get out of bed, that's the best of all. If not, then please listen as early in the morning as you possibly can. Now make sure that your body is very comfortable. If there are any tension spots in your body that may have come from a difficult dream during the night, just breathe into that area and let it go. Feel how comfortable it is for your body to be where it is. Feel the warmth and the peace and know that today will be a new day such as you have never had before. I know that you have some general plans for the day and you know what some of the experiences will be but not all of them. When we awaken in the morning we never know exactly how the day will end. Delightful surprises and wonderful adventures are before us. All of your thoughts create your future. Every thought you think is creating your future. Now it really doesn't matter what sort of thoughts you used to think in the past in all those mornings you awakened to before. The only thing that matters is the kind of thoughts that you are choosing to think now in this very moment. Together now, let's release from our consciousness all fear and anxiety, all anger and resentment, all guilt and the need for punishment. Let's dissolve all sadness and jealousy. Just let it go. Those are not the thoughts we are going to use to create this new day. This is a new day and a new beginning. Feel the air as it goes in and out of your body. It's such a miracle the way your body breathes itself. The air comes into the lungs, then it is sent over to the heart where it mingles with the blood. And this oxygenated blood is circulated throughout your body, through all the veins and arteries, down to the tiniest little capillaries, bathing and soaking and nourishing every cell in your body. You don't even have to think about how to do this. There is an intelligence within your body that takes care of it for you. It breathes your body. It beats your heart. It digests your food. This intelligence enables you to see, to walk, to hold things, to communicate with others, and to love. There are so many things in our lives that we take for granted. We so seldom take time out to be thankful and grateful 
for the many miracles we have in our everyday lives and for the miracles that we call our bodies. Too often, we only concentrate on what we do not have. It blesses our future to be thankful for what we do have now. It opens the way for the good to flow in, in ever-increasing abundance. Let us begin with appreciating the very bed we have slept in all night. Think of how warm and comfortable it has kept your body while you slept and did your dream work and refreshed your mind and your body. Thank your bed. Then bless the furniture in your home that comforts your body and fulfills various necessary functions and conveniences. We all have a favorite piece of furniture. Have you ever thanked it for being there for you? Do that now. Then think of the miracle of the electric light in your home. How wonderful it is to have it. Think of all the things that you can use electricity for. Remember our appliances are extensions of ourselves and just as our relationships with other people are more wonderful when we are loving, so it is with the relationships we have with what we call things. Appliances and automobiles do not break down when we are in good space. So mentally thank your refrigerator for being there, for keeping your food fresh for you. Thank your stove for helping you cook all those meals. Now what else do you have in your kitchen that you can bless with love? Do that now. Now think of that modern miracle called your bathroom. Even kings and queens were not able to experience the conveniences we take for granted only a century ago. So bless the plumbing system that so easily and simply removes the waste products. The hot and cold water that is so readily available to us when we just turn a small knob. The convenience of being able to bathe our bodies whenever we desire. These are all miracles. Bless the radio you listen to and the television that entertains you. Let us be grateful for the telephone that brings us love and communications with people everywhere. Bless your mailbox and the postal service that helps us communicate with people all over this planet called Earth in just a few days' time. It's a miracle that we take for granted. Let us be thankful for the air that we breathe, which is so precious to us and we take so for granted. When we exhale, we don't even think about where our next breath is coming from. Yet this incredible power that has created us has given us enough breath to last for as long as we shall live. Let us be thankful for the sunshine and the rain. Without the rain, the vegetation would die and we would have a barren planet without beauty or food. Let us be thankful for the wind that clears the skies 
and the beauty of the moonlight. Bless the vegetation that feeds and nourishes you. Whenever I eat, I bless the food with love, and I thank it for giving its life to nourish me. Now think of the clothing you wear. Think of the infinite choices we have of colors and fabrics to adorn and comfort our bodies. If it is hot, we can choose light, cool clothing. If it is cold, we can choose warm, cozy fabrics to comfort us. Think of the miracle called walking. How wonderful it is to be able to get up and to move to another place by walking. Thank your feet for taking you so many places in the world. Then look at all the other forms of transportation we have to choose from and be thankful for. There are roller skates and skateboards and bicycles and buses and trucks and automobiles, and trains, and aeroplanes, and ships that sail upon the waters. We have our choice, and we take them so for granted. How often have you been angry when your automobile did not perform perfectly? Bless your car with love, and be aware of the miracle it is to be able to get into this comfortable piece of machinery that moves you about this planet. With very few manipulations, we move forward to our destination. It's one of our daily miracles. The next time your plane is delayed, release the tendency to be angry. Instead, Acknowledge the incredible ability to be able to get into a little metal tube that rises up in the sky and swiftly takes us to another place on this planet. It is one of our safest forms of transportation. And planes need love, just as we do. Let your mind go over the various relationships you have in your life. Bless them all with love. And be thankful for them. They are all your teachers. I know you have special things in your life that you are thankful for. So take a moment to let your mind gently and lovingly move throughout your life, past or present, giving thanks for places, people, or experiences that either have been or are now in your life. It's such a wonderful feeling to be thankful. It prepares and opens the way for more good to come into our lives. There is a power and a presence that resides within us that is always there to lead us and to guide us and make smooth and easy our way. All we need to do is to acknowledge this and to allow it to work for us. Too often when we awaken in the morning, we leap out of bed and try to push our way through life, controlling everything in sight. But that's not how this power works. It's like trying to control your breathing 
or your heartbeat or your digestion. If you try, all you do is interfere and upset the natural rhythm and flow of your bodily processes. The best thing we can do for our body is to feed it natural foods and beverages, to exercise it in ways that are a pleasure to us, and to allow the intelligence in the body to take care of all the rest. So it is with our lives. We think positive, loving thoughts. We forgive others. We are kind to ourselves mentally. And then we allow the intelligence of the universe to take over and create that which is for our highest good and greatest joy. This way, the process works smoothly. The power that created us has given us the power to create our lives, the power and choice of the thoughts we think. We have infinite choice of that which we can choose to think. These choices create our future. If we choose hurt and anger and resentment, then we will just create more hurt and anger and resentment. If we want love, we must think loving thoughts. If we want joy, we must think joy. If we want to experience peace and calm, then we must think peaceful thoughts. If we want prosperity, then we must open ourselves to it mentally. If we want to flow creatively, then we must acknowledge our ability. Say this with me mentally. I am an open channel for divine ideas to flow through me and the creativity of the universe now expresses through me. That which I need to know is revealed to me and whatever I need comes to me. I am divinely protected and guided and my way is made smooth and easy. One of the things that creates so many problems for us is thoughts of anger and resentment and blame. So let us take a moment before we actively begin our day to consciously dissolve that from within our mind. Please join me in saying, I release all need for anger or resentment or blame. I truly forgive all those that need forgiving. And I forgive myself. I look forward to this day with love and peace and joy and anticipation of abundant good in every area. Wherever you are going today, send love ahead to that place. If you are going shopping, then send love ahead of you to the market or the store, to the building itself, to all the merchandise in it, to all the people, to the customers, to the employees and the owners. Know that you will be guided to make the perfect selections that will benefit you the most. And both you and the store 
will be blessed and prospered. Do the same thing if you're going to have something repaired or if you are going to see a lawyer or a doctor or a dentist. If you are going to work this morning, then do the same thing. Send love ahead of you to your place of business, to the building, to the people you work with and the people you work for, to the furniture and equipment that you use, and to anything else you will come in contact with. Let us declare together that this is a healthy, harmonious, loving, prosperous, and creative day for you. That it is filled with joy. That you welcome change and adventure. That you bring new experiences and new people into your life. If there is anyone that you expect to meet today that irritates you in any way, just bless them with love. Bless them with love, and the love that you send to them will return to you multiplied, and you will benefit in ways you cannot even imagine. Whatever we give out, returns to us. As you go through this day, say over and over to yourself, two or three hundred times is barely enough, I approve of myself. I approve of myself. Say it with me right now aloud. I approve of myself. I approve of myself. I am worth loving. I am willing to change and learn a new way of expressing and experiencing life. I now begin to accept myself exactly as I am. I approve of myself. I approve of myself. Let this day be filled with love for you. Let this day be peaceful and calm. Let this day bring new insights, new understandings. Let this day bring unexpected prosperity. Let this be a day of great joy. This is your day. This is a good day. It is a new day. This is one of the best days you have ever had. This is a new beginning. Go forth and enjoy all that there is. I love you, and we will be together again tonight to close the day. Take some nice deep breaths now. Feel the energy filling your body. Open your eyes. Stretch. Get up. Go forth and enjoy it all. Here are a few ideas for putting peace in your life permanently. Thinking of yourself as a peaceful person is the first step, but it is only the first step. The thought must translate into action in order for you to know peace. Work at curbing your inclination to create confrontation and disruption in the lives of others. A simple practice of pausing and asking yourself whether your ego, which loves turmoil, or your higher self, which loves peace, is about to act. That pause will help you to send out a peaceful response even in situations where you are feeling impatient or misunderstood. In those situations, you will be able to state simply, for example, you are really having a rough day to a hassle clerk rather than, 
I've been waiting for 15 minutes already and I'm really feeling abused. Send out peace by catching yourself and then consulting your loving presence for a response rather than relying on your ego. Practice releasing the emotions of fear and guilt and replacing them with love and forgiveness and kindness. Release the guilt by forgiving yourself and vowing to avoid that kind of conduct in the future. You do not need the guilt unless you're going to allow your ego to continue its dominance over your life forever. For example, make a list of all the things that keep you from loving yourself. Your list might include being overweight and jealous or nervous or addicted or incompetent or uncoordinated. Then regardless of how much effort it takes, reverse your mental sentences and state that you love yourself while being fat, while being addicted, and so on. This will help you to feel peaceful about the choices you've made and to realize that you are not that body or those desires. You are the invisible chooser. As you become more peaceful with the chooser, you will begin to replace the unhealthy choice in a spirit of love. Examine everything that offends you and see if you can get your ego out of the picture. If hunger and starvation in the world offend you, try shifting to a new awareness. Somehow, in some way that I do not comprehend, these things occur in divine order, and so too does my desire to change it exist in divine order. Shed what offends you and act on your desire to make corrections. There will then be no need to fight. Similarly, if you find someone else's behavior offensive, you are interpreting that behavior from your own self-absorbed position, which is that they shouldn't act the way they do. You choose to be offended, hurt, or angry by their behavior. But they are acting the way they are. Your being offended is your ego talking to you to keep you anxious and upset. If you don't take it personally, and if you see the behavior for what it is, you can work to eradicate the evils of the world unimpeded by your ego's encouragement to be offended. Keep in mind that grievances bring turmoil while communication brings peace. If you want peace in your life, rid yourself of your grievances. The way to shed these grievances is to let go of your own self-absorption and to practice forgiveness rather than revenge. As you let go, you will feel a sense of peace overtaking you. If you are angry towards someone in your life, no matter how difficult you may find it, work at communicating with that person about your aggrieved feelings. Your embarrassment or inner anguish over being wronged is just what your ego wants you to experience, since it will keep you away from your sacred quest and keep you in the clutches of your anxiety-loving ego. Keep this little sentence ready to consult. Judgment and peace are antithetical. A Course in Miracles says the strain of constant judgment is virtually intolerable. It is curious that an ability so debilitating would be so deeply cherished. You must make a daily effort to look upon others without condemnation. Every judgment takes you away from your goal of peace. Your ego loves your judgments because with them you remain in a constant state of anguish and remorse. Keep in mind that you do not define anyone with your judgment. You only define yourself as someone who needs to judge. Judging others with condemnation removes the possibility of your experiencing love. If you can practice just being still rather than condemning, you will get to the bliss I am talking about. You do not have to pretend that you love something that you loathe. Just get still and let the judgment subside. Peace is not found in being right or being hurt or being angry. By all means, work toward righting the wrongs you perceive. But do it with an understanding that an angry heart keeps you from knowing God and the path of your sacred quest. Peace will come to you when you are a healer rather than a judge. Essentially, embracing the truth is welcoming your higher self and coming to know God. All that is not authentic will drop away automatically. Your ego works hard to convince you that you are separate and better than everyone else, and you know that it does not take kindly to your embracing anything that threatens its existence. But remember that this is your inauthentic self, your false self. Deception is going to play a big role in your life when you embrace ego as your guide. Therefore, in order to abandon your reliance on that false self with all of its deception, you will have to make a new agreement with truth. I encourage you to actually write yourself a contract in which you agree to include truth as your companion in your thoughts, in your conversations, and in your life. This is a big challenge and perhaps difficult for you, but it is guaranteed to lead you to the path of your sacred self. Begin by looking honestly and fearlessly at who you are beneath all the surface trappings that you have surrounded yourself with. You have a human storyline, as does every person who has ever lived on this planet. That storyline begins with your conception, continues through your childhood, and all of your personal triumphs and tribulations, right up to this very moment. You know that there is an eternal aspect of you beneath the surface, and that for this part of you, 
Only the truth will suffice. Now you will hear about three energy fields and ways of keeping them uncontaminated. The first energy field is your immediate energy body, which I also refer to as etheric or faster. From a standing position, extend your arm forward and mentally note the most distant point where your fingers extend. Now imagine your arm extending straight above your head to a point over your body and then behind you and beneath you as well. You now have an image of a field of energy which continuously surrounds your body. I call this field your fast energy body, which is inseparable from your solid and visible slower energy body. Using your imagination, take a moment now to visualize this field of faster energy with its edges or boundaries around you. When another person, particularly a stranger, crosses your boundary, you immediately feel as if you've been invaded. You move back instinctively to create a safer distance. Why? Because your energy body feels the invasive force and alerts you with a state of discomfort. If someone remains in your energy body field for an extended period of time, they begin to affect your entire being with their energy, bringing you down if you feel out of sync with them, and raising you up if they resonate to a higher energy vibration than you. I refer to the second energy field as your broader environmental energy field. To get a sense of this physical energy field, think about your energy field extending into your home, your workplace, your family, and your community. The vibrational pattern of this energy field is your broader environmental energy field. This energy field in which your solid body walks and talks and sleeps and works and plays is impacted by the energy frequency of whoever enters it. Now I want you to think of a field of energy so immense that you cannot even create imaginary boundaries for it. I call this the mind field energy. Your thoughts and the thoughts of others interact in your mind field in such a way as to raise or lower your frequency of vibration. When the thoughts and feelings of others impinge upon your mind energy field, there will be one of two results. Either your energy field will be increased, as is said to have happened when Buddha and Jesus entered a village, just their presence in the village and nothing more would raise the consciousness of those around them. Or, your energy field will be decreased and consequently become contaminated. The way others think and how they radiate out their thought energy can impact you. But it is not only people who impact your energy fields. Noise levels, air quality, food purity, all touch and affect your fields of energy. What you may not realize is that you play a potent role in keeping your energy fields clean and uncontaminated, and that you also have a salubrious and cleansing effect on the energy field of those around you. Hopefully, you will be motivated to begin implementing a new approach that will clear all of your energy fields and maintain a state of clarity, free of energy patterns that contaminate your life in any way. How do you treat this body, which is the living organism that sends out the waves of electromagnetic energy? What foods do you use to replenish and replace it with? What toxins do you absorb? How much peaceful rest do you provide for it? Do you exercise it regularly? Is your emotional state calm? Do you meditate to bring yourself into harmony with God? Your body must be loved. It is your home and must be cleansed of all junk. Your body is not your enemy. You do not need to get free of your body in order to access spiritual guidance. This perfectly functioning machine called your body knows what is needed, where it is needed, and how to prioritize those needs in times of crisis. You control this marvelously complex instrument that is your home through your thoughts. The second factor that impacts your immediate field of energy is what you allow to impact your body from without. What kinds of people do you allow into your immediate space? When you allow toxic people into your immediate energy field, you will find that your feelings of well-being diminish. You must say goodbye, albeit with unconditional love, to anyone who pollutes your life space with slowed down energy. Or, you must be prepared to stave off the intrusion of lower energy people first by recognizing it and then neutralizing it by radiating stronger energy yourself. The problem with attempting to continually be a neutralizer is that the effort required often exhausts you and that level of fatigue makes you susceptible to the lower energies. If someone brings anxiety, shame, depression, fear, whining, complaining, apathy, stress, worry, anger, guilt, or any of the multitude of what I call lower energy patterns, they are inviting you to join in their misery 
and load your life up with the problems that they live with every day. Resolve to remove yourself from any toxicity that threatens the purity of your life space. When you feel yourself being breached, take immediate action, first by recognizing what is happening, and then moving in counteraction. Consciously send out thoughts of kindness and love. Remove yourself in a conflict-free way from the invading energetic forces. Anyone who you allow to be a regular visitor in your body energy field must come with love, peace, and the higher spiritual energies. The closer you come to being in a dynamic state of grace in your thoughts and refusing to be in the fields of those who are projecting lower energy thoughts, the closer you come to being in God's mind field. I'm in a 72-year-old body today. I remember being in a 20-year-old body and um, in a 30-year-old body and a 40-year-old body. And you can't find one cell of the body that I was in when I was 20 years old, 50 years ago. There's not one cell left. You go out there and I can't find it. <laughs> it had all kinds of flowing stuff coming out of my head and, uh, you know, it's like... Uh, on. <laughs> You're not doing anything. You're just being done. That's one of the things that the Tao says. That, uh, the Tao is just another term for God. For God. The Tao does nothing. It leaves nothing undone. It leaves nothing undone. <laughs> makes the planets stay in alignment, the sun comes out, the oceans are filled, life goes on, fish reproduce themselves, roses show up, and there's nobody out there doing anything. <laughs> it does nothing. So the question of who we are is, um, can't be answered in physical terms, and it can't be answered with the senses. Your senses will lie to you. They will tell you something, and it's just not true, you know. I mean, our senses even tell us right now that we're sitting still <laughs> when we're hurling through this ocean, right, at 20 knots. But we're also, so is the whole ocean, hurling through space at something like 11 or 12,000 miles an hour. And it's also, it's also orbiting around the sun and turning on its axis. So it's turning, orbiting, and hurling all at the same moment. <laughs> and your senses are saying, I'm just sitting here. <laughs> you, have to don't, you don't see with your eyes. You have to see through your eyes. The part of you that is processing what I'm saying here right now has no form to it, has no beginning, it has no end. There's an infinite part of you. There's an invisible part of you. And until you're comfortable with it and know it and understand that it is the creator, the creation takes place through this creative process in a, in, within you called your mind, called your thoughts, called your spirit, called your soul. And one of the things that I have learned is that it's, it's, it's necessary to understand what your soul is to follow your excitement. Now hear this. Your excitement is who you are. Just let that in. We're getting very philosophical. I love it when we get like this. Especially when I know we have lots of time so we can just take it, you know, just... Your excitement is who you are. You're not this body, it's the soul, it's this invisibleness, it's what causes you to feel passion, it's following your excitement, and it's something you can do at any time, and when you do, I guarantee you these two things, it will be effortless, and you will always be supported. It's always an effort when you are not following your excitement. What is it in here? What is that creative spark that just makes you want to do something or you just feel drawn to do it? And the more you pay attention to this spark, this inner excitement, 
the more it will it will support you and you'll find yourself doing amazing things like really amazing things here's what uh, patanjali the great uh, third century bc indian scholar great beautiful soul who was the uh, the father of meditation one who taught me the japa meditation then the i am meditation he said when you are inspired inspired means in spirit when you are inspired that means when you are following your excitement when you are inspired by some great project some extraordinary project all of your thoughts break their bonds your mind transcends limitations your consciousness expands in every direction and you find yourself in a new and a great and a wonderful world and then he said and this is what i mean by being effortless he said dormant forces faculties and talents come alive and you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever dreamed yourself to be or i say were ever taught that you could become because you were not raised to believe in your divinity you were raised as, as as rumi said in that thing i read be between the chinese and the byzantines you were raised to believe in your limitations and you don't know that within you you have god you are god god is not an external concept it's what the ego has taught us that it is so that if you can answer the question who am i who am i and understand that who you are is a divine a divine speck if you will a divine fragment of the universal consciousness god's one and only voice is silence means that god is that which is indivisible there is no place that god is not and you can't divide god up and say that god is on this side or god is on that side i've often said that god isn't doing anything different now than god was doing an hour ago or 100 years ago and god isn't doing anything different now than he will be doing a thousand years from now god is exclusively here and now not elsewhere not in heaven some place apart from us but here now and indivisible and the word indivisible is very important because that which is everywhere and cannot be separated or carved up is something that we have a great deal of difficulty in the world of the physical form experiencing and understanding because our world the world of you listening here is a world of dichotomies it's a world of paradoxes we divide everything up and dichotomies are just our way of being we divide everything in the world up the only reason we know that something called darkness exists is because of light if there was nothing called light we wouldn't know anything called darkness the only reason we have a concept called up is because we have something of its reverse called down you've never seen a person with a front who doesn't have a back <laughs> you've never seen a person with an outside who doesn't have an inside we divide everything everything is in the world of the of the divisible in the bhagavad gita it speaks about transcending the dichotomies figuring out a way to get past the up down the male female the good bad the right wrong the old the new the alive and the dead everything has its dichotomy you can always find its opposites in fact that's how the symbolism of language is created through having opposites we don't know about oneness in the physical world everything has its counterpart its dichotomy except for silence 
silence is the only experience that is the same as God. It is indivisible. You take silence, and we'll have some right now, and now let's just cut that in half. And what do we have? More silence. Let's take what we've cut in half and cut it in half again and again. And endlessly you attempt to divide into a dichotomy, silence, but you can never do it because silence is indivisible. And silence is God's one and only voice. When you go into silence, you go into the place where you make conscious contact with God, whatever it is that God means to you. You make conscious contact with that omnipotent, omniscient force in the world, that omnipresence of God. And the reason I say that it's not crowded along the extra mile is because the mile that most people are on is a very, very noisy mile. And I encourage young people to become more comfortable with silence. We, have, we live in a world of uh, bulldozers and leaf blowers and trucks that make endless amounts of noise and chatter. And constantly, I, I have a home, uh, a place that I, a retreat that I go to frequently on Maui, and oftentimes I will walk in the morning and they're in a big building project in Maui and I'll go past one building after another and start to count the noisemakers as all of these machines and all of these people who are trying to make the place look so pristine and so beautiful and, and so landscaped um, instead of just letting it grow, just letting it be. Silence and God are one because you can't divide either one of them. Okay? So that going to silence as frequently as you can and understanding that out of silence, everything is created. The words that you are listening to right now as I speak emerge from silence. That silence is the source. And it's the source that is what we want to make conscious contact with. Like the source of all light is the sun. And the only reason we know about light is because of something called darkness. But when you go to the source, the source can't be divided. Two quotes, the first from the Upanishads, quote, Life in the world and life in the spirit are not incompatible, unquote. And from Soren Kierkegaard, the great Danish theologian, quote, The majority of men live without being thoroughly conscious that they are spiritual beings, unquote. Heaven should not be thought of as a place you'll ultimately arrive at once you leave this earthly existence. Rather, it seems to me that you'd want to experience heaven right here on earth, as the title of this chapter suggests from a poem by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Earth itself is crammed with heaven. But do you see heaven in your daily life? Do you feel as if you're in a heavenly world? If the answer is no, then you're out of balance. You've probably made your physical world the primary focus of your life with little or no attention given to the heavenly part of your earthly existence. What this imbalance looks like. When you place the larger part of your life energy on the material world, you're generally in a continual state of worry about your stuff, and you feel like you'll never get ahead in this game of life. Virtually all of your mental energy is focused on what you have or don't have. You assess your worth based on such material issues as what kind of automobile you drive or how fashionably you're dressed. You may even feel inferior because other people have more stuff. This imbalance between the spiritual and material world usually means that indebtedness is a way of life. You place a heavy emphasis on winning, becoming number one, and comparing yourself to others. A preoccupation with the material aspects of life leads to looking at life in a superficial way. 
where appearance is viewed as more important than substance. What others think is the most important measuring device and how you stack up to externally imposed standards becomes all important. All of this anxiety that leads to stress is avoidable if you opt to balance the material spiritual scale. Just a balance, an even split between these two aspects of yourself is all you need to achieve. The title of this chapter, Earth's Crammed with Heaven, is meant to signify that it's all right here, right now, not in some other place, in a distant future years from now, or after the death of your physical self. Heaven is right here, now, at this time, when you find your balance point. Equalizing the Balance Scale Heaven is a state of mind, not a location. Since spirit is everywhere and in everything, you can begin equalizing your material and spiritual life by making a conscious decision to look for the unfolding of spirit in everything and everyone that you encounter. I personally do this by making an effort to look upon my world as if I were observing it through lenses that filter out the form and all of the material aspects of what I'm seeing, and I can only view the spiritual energy that allows what I'm noticing to exist. Try putting on these imaginary magical lenses and see how different everything appears. The natural world is a pleasant place to begin this experiment. Nature When you look at a tree without these imaginary form-fitting lenses, you may see branches, blossoms, leaves, and perhaps mangoes or plums. With your enchanting new lenses, the lines that form tree boundaries dissolve, and there's an energy vibrating so fast that it gives a whole new perspective of the tree. You see the spaces between the leaves and notice the silence of the now-defunct acorn or mango pit out of which the first sprout of creation emerged, jump-starting the whole process that eventually became the tree you're looking at. You see the continuation of this life-giving process residing deep within the tree that lets it sleep in the winter and blossom in the spring or into infinity or at least for the duration of its life. You realize that new mangoes are producing not only new fruit, but an infinity of mango trees as well. You see this life force in just one tree extending backward and forward in a never-ending stream of creation. Begin looking at all of nature with this new vision. Birds, ants, lakes, mountains, clouds, stars, all of it. Deepen your vision so that you no longer see only form and boundaries. Appreciate the miracle that is your environment. As you do so, you're getting into balance. People These new lenses allow you to see everyone in a fresh perspective. You're no longer seeing tall and short, dark and light, male and female, old and young, beautiful and homely. Your lenses blur the lines that categorize people by cultural or religious differences, and you don't see others as only their attire or physical appearances or the language they speak. All appearances dissolve through filters in your lenses and your thoughts, so you now see the unfolding of the spiritual energy in every person you encounter. What you notice is pure love vibrating right before your eyes. You see kindness personified. You see and feel the same vulnerabilities in all others that you feel within yourself. You see enormous strands of peaceful, glimmering energy connecting each of us. Your new outlook invites you to playfully imagine that two people created you, and four people created the two people who created you, and eight people created the four people who created the two people who created you. As we go back a few more generations to the time of Abraham Lincoln, there are 16,000 people you're related to who had to come together to create you. We can imagine going back to the time of Socrates and puzzle over the apparent math we come up with. Trillions of people were needed to create one of us, but trillions of people haven't even existed, so somehow, in some mathematically puzzling way, we're all related to each other. These are the kinds of fascinating connections that you can begin to observe with your imaginary lenses transforming your thoughts. You discover that there's no one to judge, no one to hate, and no one to harm because you see clearly that we're related. In fact, we're all one. From here, you can extend your perspective to include all of life. Events Where you once viewed the comings and goings of people as pure happenstance in current time shaping the events of your life and the lives of everyone else, Your new filtering lenses allow you to see how all of these things are connected energetically. Now you see an infinite network of laser-like energies emanating from the thoughts of everyone, blending the events in everyone's life in energetic perfection. You see people with very fast vibrations of energy matching up perfectly with the energy of the source of creation. You see how they attune with the all-creating, all-knowing source of life and how events are perfectly attracted in a vibrational match. You also see what appears to be accidents, tragedies, and horrors, and how they, too, are vibrational matches that collide in what you've called mistakes, but are really the result of two or more energies meeting in a larger picture that you couldn't previously see. 
You witness the connection between the expectations of individuals and what they attract into their lives. With these amazing lenses, you note that all events and all accidental encounters are really incredibly compatible vibrational matches rather than randomly occurring situations. With this awareness, you're attaining a level of balance between spirit and form. If you don't accept yourself, um, nothing else, no one else is either. You know, it's like, you know, I think of it as like, uh, we're, all, we're all creations of God. We, we all come from the same place. You know, T.S. Eliot said that, uh, you know, we shall not cease from exploration, but at the end of all of our exploring will be to return to the place from which we originated and to know it for the first time. And he was speaking about death, and I don't. I don't think, I, I don't take that as a, an explanation of death. I take that as an, a, an explanation of an, a, of an understanding that we all emerged from this place, the same place, that we're all connected. Everything in this universe is connected. Larry Dossi has just written a beautiful book called One Mind, yeah. uh, and I've just finished reading it, and it's like showing scientifically yeah. how everything is connected to everything in this universe, and you can't take anything and not see the connection to it. Uh, especially at the quantum level, so that um, so so you who you are is a, a creation of God. You know, in my in my book, Wishes Fulfilled, I talk about it's like one of the things you have to recognize is that your highest self is God. Wow. You must be like what you came from. So a little tiny spark of who you are is is the Tao, is God, is divine mind, is Krishna, is consciousness, is Buddha, whatever you want to call it. And the Tao, the opening line of the Tao says, the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. We can't find a name for it. It's just like, but it's, the, the best name we can come for it is something called love. It's just love. It's divine love. And so this is what you came from. So if you don't accept yourself, you're not accepting something that, uh, you know, is, is, the, is the creation of God. You know, because... Truly, I mean, it's like the, the greatest wisdom that you can have is the recognition that you are a piece of this divinity. And I walk around with just, in a, you know, Rumi said, you know, sell your cleverness and purchase bewilderment. I'm just in a state of bewilderment about it all. And when you accept yourself, you love yourself. And when you love yourself, that's what you have to give away. And the only thing that you can give away, and that's what a saint is, yeah. someone who can only give love away, because that's all they have inside. Yeah. That's been my goal in my life, is to just to have no enemies, yeah. to have nothing, and to particularly not to have make an enemy of myself, yeah. to love everything about myself. And while I was going through the last six months of this pain, the stuff we tapped on yeah. down in Australia and so on, uh, most of the time, and you've heard me say it many times, say there's a, there's a lesson in this yeah. for me. And I just had to do, I just did a public uh, television special, another public television special. And when I got an hour and a half before the show to start, I was in, I got one of these attacks again in the neck. And I was just like, you know, how am I going to get through this thing and so on. And I, I said a prayer. My wife was there. Two of my girls were there. We were in the room. I had my arms around them. And I said, if I'm supposed to endure this pain, you know, for whatever reason that I don't even understand yet, I'm willing to do it. But could I please just have the next couple of hours so that I could at least get through this this experience? And it just dissolved. And I was able, you were there, you were in the audience, and I was able to go out there and do it. And then the pain returned the next day, and I went right back to that state, and I still do it now. And I can, I can feel it even now as we're talking about it a little bit here. And instead of cursing it, instead of being angry at it, I accept it as, uh, as my dharma. This is, you know, and whatever it is that I have to learn from it, generally speaking, Every difficulty I've had in my life, yeah. getting divorced, literally being uh, uh, someone who is addicted to uh, substances, including alcohol, um, letting go of uh, you know those kinds of uh, beliefs that those are terrible things that I should be ashamed of, they've been amongst my greatest oh. teachers. And this pain is just another one of those things. And generally speaking, I now can go out and help people who live in chronic pain. Yeah. And you do a lot of this with yeah. your tapping. You know, I've seen you do it on stage, you know, with people. On, when we, in fact, when we were out in Australia, that one woman, what was it? She couldn't even... Well, move. there's one lady with a frozen shoulder who right. couldn't move her who arm. Who hadn't been it, able to move her arm in no, years. Year. In 20 minutes, she got it yeah, up like that. Yeah, you know? So it's like, and that comes from just accepting yourself and, and actually instead of cursing the pain, yeah. because when you curse the pain and get angry at it, you just, you get angry. Every cell of your oh. being goes through that same anger. And what you want to do is... Just get to that peaceful place within yourself where you say, you know, when you trust in yourself, when you trust in yourself, you're really trusting in the wisdom that created you.
Wow. You know, and the wisdom that created you is infinite wow. and it's formless. And so, so your thoughts are in that same category. Have thoughts that are aligned with that divine, that, that divine presence. Yeah. You'll see it going away. Yeah. Quote from A Course in Miracles. The memory of God comes to the quiet mind. It cannot come where there is conflict. For a mind at war against itself remembers not eternal gentleness. What you remember is a part of you, for you must be as God created you. Let all this madness be undone for you, and turn in peace to the remembrance of God, still shining in your quiet mind. It's about remembering our origination. I committed this passage to memory many years ago, and I use it as a way to remember who I truly am and where I really came from, particularly when I communicate with my Creator to stay on purpose and in spirit. Now I'd like to go through each of the messages in this observation from A Course in Miracles one by one. Number one, the memory of God comes to the quiet mind. We came from a quiet, peaceful place. That's the very essence of creation. So when our mind is filled with noisy dialogue, we shut out the possibility of remembering our spirit. Incessant chatter keeps us attached to the physical world and produces anxiety, stress, fear, worry, and so many of the emotional reactions that are decidedly removed from God realization. We must minimize distractions when we wish to communicate with God. So being in nature, away from the artificial noises that invade our space, is helpful. But the most important thing to consider is how to keep our mind free from the dizzying, bewildering cascade of thoughts flowing through our head from morning till night, and even on into our dream state. It's been estimated that we have something like 60,000 separate thoughts every day. The real problem is that we have the same 60,000 thoughts today that we had yesterday. I've made the practice of meditation a part of my daily life because it's one way to quiet the mind so that the memory of God is accessible. So by learning to meditate, or at the very least shutting down the inner dialogue produced, directed, and acted upon by your ego, you can open up a space for remembering and returning to spirit. 2. It cannot come where there is conflict. In order for conflict to exist, there must be two opposing forces at work. That is, one force in the form of an idea, a point of view, a desire, or a contribution, directly clashes with another. Conflict defines our lives in many ways, as we oppose our partners, our children, our bosses, our neighbors, and even our countries. In politics, it's always one party versus the other. And the entertainment industry portrays battling points of view that are usually turned into violent scenes. Essentially, conflict requires two-ness. However, remembering where we came from involves our returning to the oneness of being in spirit. After all, there are no battling powers in the divine realm of spirit. There's only perfect oneness. And this is what we want to rejoin. We want to become one again with our Creator. And we can't retrieve this memory of God with a mind in conflict in any way. 3. For a mind at war against itself remembers not eternal gentleness. The second part of this teaching from A Course in Miracles reinforces that a combative mind cannot remember where it once resided in eternal gentleness. Obviously, you can't wage war and simultaneously focus on peace and gentleness, and it is eternal gentleness that you want to remember and rejoin. It's really quite simple to do this. Just close down the battlefield and surrender. Remove all of the artillery, send the soldiers home, and replace the instruments of war in your mind with thoughts of peace, tranquility, and surrender. Making your mind a place of peace is achieved by your own will, so steadfastly refusing to have thoughts of conflict allows you to activate the glory of remembering your spirit. 4. The fourth part of this quote. What you remember is a part of you. Every memory I have is me. What a glorious feeling it is to know this. We each have the power to retrieve any piece of ourselves that we desire and to experience it right here, right now, in this present moment. The great Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard once observed that life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. In other words, if we can't go back and remember the spiritual bliss that defined us before the beginning, we've really abandoned a part of ourselves. As we move into communion with God, we must know that our inability to remember our spiritual origins is another way of really saying, quote, I'm unable to know myself because I have no recollection or memory of my spirit 
unquote. In fact, the corollary of this line from A Course in Miracles that we're processing right now would be, what you don't remember is not a part of you. In other words, if we fail to remember spirit, then obviously it isn't a part of us. And five, for you must be as God created you. As you communicate with your source of being, know that you're awakening a part of yourself that's just like God. In fact, you ought to try to approach communication with God by being as closely aligned to the way that you were created as possible. That is, by becoming a vibrational match to the all-loving Creator. Come to the quiet moments in consultation with God in love, in peace, and without judgment. As A Course in Miracles is saying, you must be as you were created. So why put on a false mask and pretend to be anything or anyone else? In this way, you can open the channel of communication because you finally remembered to be the way you were created. And that's the key to effective prayer. And as Gandhi once said, prayer is not an old woman's idle amusement. Properly understood and applied, it's the most potent instrument of action. And six, let all this madness be undone for you and turn in peace to the remembrance of God still shining in your quiet mind. Let's take the three suggestions in this teaching one at a time. First, a course says, let this madness be undone. The madness here is that of living in a state of conflict. In other words, we must make an attempt to transcend the dichotomies of our life because the division creates so much suffering and keeps us from living an inspired life. I remember a Ramdas lecture in which he said, I firmly come to the conclusion that there are no thems for me anymore. I can't be told who to hate, who to fight, who to subdue. I only see an us in my heart. All those messages to divvy up our world are insane. All our self-centeredness just drives our ego's insatiable appetite for making us special and putting other people down. The Course encourages us to be done with this madness once and for all, both in our minds and in our actions. And second, we're told to turn in peace to the remembrance of God. Once again, we know in our heart that we came from a place of peace. So any discord can't be the result of our Creator's actions. God cannot come to us when we pray from non-peace, so the solution is to return to the remembrance of Him and ask to be made an instrument of His peace. When I find myself out of sorts, I remember. And what I remember is to turn to peace right now in prayer. I become peace rather than anguish, and I feel the calmness I long for come over me like a wave of pleasurable relief. The most important thing that you will gain from cultivating unconditional love will be freedom from hate and violence. When these thoughts are removed, you discover the presence of joy and peace. This is an automatic reaction to unconditional love because you are in harmony with the creative source. The ego identifies you primarily as a physical body, separate from God, and in need of constant stroking to massage your self-importance. When you simply say this is an illusion and it doesn't really exist, those ideas are replaced with unconditional love, and the joy you experience is really the denial of the false and an affirmation of the truth of your being. You are absolutely free when you are not consumed with your self-importance. You are free when you no longer need to be stroked, coddled, and approved of by everyone you meet. There is a great sense of joy in feeling free. Think of times when you have felt the freest in your life, when the pressures to perform are off, when you are walking in nature, when you are in solitude and communing with God. Joy, freedom, and unconditional love are inseparable. They flow from the experience of each other. To be joyful is to hold on to nothing and to have no restrictions. This is also the feeling of freedom, and it is a result of embracing the unconditional love of the divine energy that is the center of your being. This is not to say that one ought not to enjoy a massage, a delicious meal, lovemaking, and all of the pleasures of the body, but it is the mind that is processing and allowing you to experience the pleasure. It is the mind that makes it real. Your purpose is to align your mind with the unconditional love that is the divine source of all material things, including your body. With that alignment comes joy and power. When one drop of water separates from the ocean, it becomes a speck that is essentially powerless and weak. But when it aligns with its source, the ocean itself, it is powerful beyond what is possible as an individual drop of ocean. And so it is with you. It's a difficult thing for our egos to contemplate this concept of oneness. Unconditional love and becoming a co-creator in your life is possible when you know that God is not separate from you. You and God are one and the same. In the New Testament, 
Jesus says to the multitudes, I have said, Ye are gods. And later, When a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. One of the great meditation exercises that I learned many years ago involves imagining lifting yourself out of your body and floating into space so far that you are actually observing the entire planet. If you do this, try to imagine what the earth is like without you on it. It is a very difficult task for your ego to even contemplate the world without you on it. Next, begin to observe the planet without any judgment, refusing to label anything good or bad, right or wrong. Simply instruct yourself to notice, allow, and send unconditional love. The process of being a detached observer occurs in the silence of your contemplations or meditations. Begin by seeking out time to be quiet and enter this inner place of love. It is in that silence that you will come to truly know the divine energy of unconditional love. Remember to keep uppermost in mind that love transforms. Unconditional love heals the body and the mind. And then also remember that the polarity of love is fear. Fear is a current of energy that literally runs through your body and is produced when you feel cut off from the source of unconditional love. Every time you experience fear, ask yourself, what's going on that I have substituted fear for love in this moment? Also, begin to acquire a private, non-publicized and regular habit of meditating. With every breath you take, feel yourself taking in unconditional love. With every exhalation, expel thoughts of fear. Then pick one day to practice this exercise with a partner of your choice. Make a decision to think, act and radiate nothing but unconditional love for the entire 24-hour period, including your dreams. If this works for you for one day, see if you can extend it for another day or two. Also. Try making a decision to turn over your most difficult challenges in the area of unconditional love to God. Simply turn them over with a request such as, I have been unable to bring love into my life in these areas, and I am asking for your divine guidance in accomplishing this. Also, in your silent moments of prayer, do not be afraid to ask for help. And then know the connection between manifesting your heart's desire and unconditional love. Without your connection to this love, you lose your connection to the creative process. Unconditional love is in all things you wish to attract as well as in you. Keep it honestly, and you keep your ability to know that you are a God. Lose it, and you lose your godliness. It is that simple. It is with unconditional love that you find your true connection to the divine energy that is in all things.